Hello, hello, I'm Alibar, sir. Hello, I'm Alibar, sir. Hello, 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 I'm Alibar, sir. Mm -hmm. uh yes i just turned on my uh uh speaker uh oh sure sir uh sure we shall, we shall take five minutes to configure our system uh, uh, what is that uh, What is that?
Jesse, they seem to be having some sort of problems, so I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, just very instantaneously. Where are you? Okay, but take it home. What? Okay, good. And also, when the radio goes on, just turn it off, okay? It'll go on at 
we are really sorry sir uh, we are facing some technical issues and cannot get the audio to work uh, so give us 5 more minutes that that's okay if you can hear me we cannot hear you sir Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, we can start soon. Uh, if you can, you please display the slides. Okay. Um, apparently, nobody is on Zoom. Um, at least that's what I see on my screen. Is that correct? Can uh, we we've joined the Zoom call, sir? Can you see our video? That, uh, uh, yes, I can see the room. uh that is us only sir uh, we joined and opened a different camp okay um okay you would like me to open the um the pdf shall i open the talk? yes sir yes sir okay. and we can start uh, as you wish uh so, so for a short introduction i'd like to invite rajneesh okay so i will share my screen now is that okay Yes, sir. Um, my screen sharing is disabled. You have to give me permission. Uh, yes, sir. We are doing it. Okay, so far I can't uh, share the screen. Yes, okay, sir. Can you try now? We have enabled the sharing settings. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. It's visible now. Okay. Can you see this now? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, so we will be starting after a short introduction. Introduction of yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. So today, uh, is the fourth event of Cosmic Voyage. and the UK is an incredible scientific research foundation. Please well known for their advances in cultural research with us in quantum field theory and is very known for his research in city symmetry and its applications in broad initial quantum mechanics and which has significantly uh, impacted its piece of physics, particularly optics. So, Professor, we can start now. 
Um, I can barely hear you. Um, this the, um, is there a problem with the connection still? Mm, hello, sir. We, are we audible now? Okay, yes, now sir. I can hear you. Oh, okay, sir. So okay. we can start now. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction for the uh, invitation to speak to you. Um, I'm very happy to do it. Of course, I wish I were there in person, um, but I hope this will be um, a close second. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about um, Okay, today I'm going to tell you about um, the problem of how to sum a series. Uh, this is a very deep question. Um, it involves a theory called summation theory. And um, it is absolutely essential that you understand this if you are going into physics or in fact any branch of science or mathematics. Um, it is a very non-trivial problem for how to sum a series, uh, there are two possibilities. One possibility is what to do if the series converges, because this is a very difficult and non-trivial problem. Um, and of course, the second part is what to do if the series diverges, and that's even more interesting. Okay, so, let me see, oh. I'm, let's see, I'm unable to, there we go. Okay, so as I'm, uh, I, I hope you have some knowledge of um, uh, the, the problem of how to sum a series. Um, in particular, divergent series are, um, very strange animals, um, and uh, we are going to talk about the physics as well as the mathematics of divergent series. Okay. Okay, so remember that series arise when we use perturbation theory to solve difficult problems in physics. Um, when you take an elementary course in physics, what you learn is how to solve the problems uh, that you face exactly. But in real life, almost no problems can be solved exactly. That's almost impossible, okay? And it's extremely rare. Um, so what do you do if you cannot solve a problem exactly? Well, you have to use some sort of approximation method. Um, and so if you have a frighteningly difficult problem, what do you do? You do perturbation theory, okay? And perturbation theory, uh, which some of you may have learned about in an elementary course on quantum mechanics, um, what you do is you insert a small parameter which you often call epsilon into the problem. Okay, now you have an equation, it's a very difficult equation. And now what you do is you put in a new variable called epsilon. Okay, so now you're no longer solving one problem, you're solving an infinite number of problems, one for each value of epsilon. So it sounds like this is a very, um, silly thing to do. But the advantage of doing this is that, as you'll see, this converts a hard problem, a very hard problem, into a sequence of smaller and easier problems. Okay, so let's take that great big frightening problem and turn it into a series of smaller and easier problems. And these problems may be easy enough that you can solve them one at a time. You can solve this problem and then this problem and this problem and so on. Okay, so mathematically, this is what you do. There are always three steps when you are faced with a difficult problem that you're solving 
using perturbation theory, the first step is to insert a small parameter epsilon in such a way that you can solve the problem when epsilon equals zero. Okay, so we now have a hard problem, which is a function of epsilon. In fact, we have an infinite number of problems, one for each value of epsilon. Okay, step two is you expand the answer as a perturbation series, which is a Taylor series in powers of epsilon. Okay, so here's the answer as a function of epsilon, and it's a series in powers of epsilon. And then you solve the easier problems one at a time. You solve for A0, A1, A2, A3, and you keep working until you get tired. And then you set epsilon equals one to get back to the original problem that you were trying to solve. And you sum the series. And this is the hard part. And this is the point of the lecture that I'm giving you today. Okay, so I wanna show you a simple example to make sure that we all understand what is going on. I'm gonna give you a, a quote, hard problem. So you know that there's a formula for solving uh, a quadratic equation, a cubic equation, a quartic equation, but that's it. There is no general formula for solving uh, a higher power uh, algebraic equation. So here is a quintic equation. It involves the fifth power of x, okay? And let me give you a hard problem. The hard problem is to find the positive root of this fifth degree polynomial equation. Now the answer is this, okay? That's the exact answer numerically taken from a computer, but how do you do it analytically? Okay, so let's remember the three steps that I told you about. Um, you insert an epsilon. So instead of solving this problem, I'm gonna solve this problem. Okay, so now we have an infinite number of problems, one for each value of epsilon, but I want you to notice that I can solve, I have put epsilon into the problem in such a way that when epsilon equals zero, I can solve this equation, okay? That equation is x to the five equals one. And the solution to that uh, equation is, the, for the positive root, is one, okay? So now, step two. I'm going to look for x, the answer, as a formal power series, a Taylor series, in powers of epsilon. And we know the first term in the series because that is the term that you get when you solve the equation for epsilon equals zero. Remember, the answer is one, okay? So what I do is I substitute this series into this equation. And I collect powers of epsilon, okay? and if we match powers of epsilon, I get a set of equations for the terms in that series, okay? These, this is what the equations look like. They gradually get longer and more complicated, but this is very easy to do. It's just busy work, okay? So all that's involved is raising a power series to a power and collecting powers of epsilon. Okay, so let me stop there. I hope you all understand what I mean. Okay, so the question is, do you understand what I'm saying when I say that I'm going to raise this series to the fifth power? Okay, you have to multiply this series times itself five times. This is a mess but you can teach elementary school students to do this. It's just a mess, okay? So we get these equations, okay? And now we solve them one at a time. The solution to the first equation, obviously, is minus one-fifth, 
And the solution to the second equation, this one is minus one over 25 and so on. And we calculate away until we get very tired. Okay. And so I am giving you the first six terms in our perturbation expansion. And now I put that back into my series and this is what my perturbation series looks like. Okay, now please ask questions if you have any problems with what I'm doing here. Okay, so step three is that we have to sum this series when epsilon equals one, and that will give us the final answer. So the question is, does this series converge? And fortunately, this series does converge. I've picked a very easy problem. And in fact, the radius of convergence of the series is exactly this. And if you would like an interesting mathematical problem to work on, it's easy, relatively easy to prove that this series converges so long as epsilon in absolute value is less than 1.64. And we need to sum this series at epsilon equals one. So in fact, it works. There's no problem. We plug in epsilon equals one, and we sum the series, one minus a fifth, minus a 25th, minus one over 125, plus 21 over 156, and so on. And when we do that, we get this result, 0.75434. And remember, the exact answer is 75488. So with a small amount of work, we have found a very good approximation. And if we calculate more terms in the series, we will get an even better approximation. Already, the answer we have gotten has an error of 0.07%. So this is very good, okay? And what you see, is that perturbation theory can be very, very powerful and it can solve very hard problems, very non-trivial problems, okay? Now, there isn't a unique way to insert epsilon into a hard problem. For example, we could have inserted epsilon over here because again, if we set epsilon equal to zero, we can solve the problem exactly. And the answer is x naught equals one. And if we work out the perturbation series, this is what the perturbation series looks like. And now you see something interesting. The coefficients in this perturbation series are getting larger and larger and larger, okay? Now, what we have to do to finish the perturbation problem is we have to sum the series at epsilon equals one. And the radius of convergence of this series, and here is another interesting mathematical problem that you can work on. The radius of convergence is exactly four to the four over five to the five, which is this number. 0.08. Now, this series converges if epsilon is less than 0.08, but we want to sum the series at epsilon equals one. And so we have a big problem. If we plug epsilon equals one into this series, we get 21,000. And this is not a good approximation to the exact answer. Remember, the exact answer was around 0.7. So this is not good and this procedure stinks. So what's the problem here? Is there a problem with doing perturbation theory? And the answer is no. In fact, this is a perfectly good series. And if we can learn how to sum a series that diverges, we will get the correct answer. But this means that we have to learn some interesting mathematics about how to sum a series that diverges. And that's what this talk is about. 
So remember, this series diverges, but summation theory solves this problem as we're going to see. Now, you may not have learned about it, but there is a technique that we don't have time to talk about in today's lecture, but we can use one technique for summing a divergent series is called Pade theory. And if we sum that divergent series using Pade theory, we get the number 0.76369, which is an error of just over 1%. So Pade theory works to sum the series. And just because you have a divergent series does not mean that you uh, are unable to sum the series. In fact, you can still sum the series and get the correct answer. Okay, so the most subtle and interesting issue when you do perturbation theory, that is approximate mathematics, the kind of mathematics you use to solve difficult problems, all of that physics is supported by the technique of summation theory. Okay, so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is we must learn how to sum a series, especially if it diverges. Okay, so to begin with, I want to give you some advice. When we sum a series, okay, so this symbol for a series is the Greek letter S, and S stands for sum, okay? But my advice to you is that the dumbest way to sum a series is simply to add up the numbers in the series. And this is true if the series is convergent, and it's true if the series is divergent. In either case, adding up, attempting to add up the numbers in a series is usually the dumbest way to find the sum of the series. You should never do that. Okay, so I wanna give you a problem from physics a uh, very interesting problem from physics. Um, this is an old problem. It has been studied by many mathematical physicists. This is called the quantum and harmonic oscillator. Hopefully many of you have studied quantum mechanics. This is the Hamiltonian for the anharmonic oscillator. And if you studied quantum mechanics, you know that if you don't have this X to the four term, what you're left with is the harmonic oscillator, p squared over two plus x squared over two. And this problem is an easy problem and you can solve it exactly. So there's no problem, there's no difficulty with the harmonic oscillator, but when we put in an x to the four in the potential, now it becomes a very difficult problem. In fact, no one has ever found an exact solution to this problem and I don't think anybody ever will. So how do you solve this very difficult problem? Well, you insert an, ep an epsilon and you put an epsilon over here. Why? Because when epsilon equals zero, you can solve the problem. If epsilon equals zero, the anharmonic oscillator becomes the harmonic oscillator, okay? Now suppose we would like to find the ground state energy of this in this potential, we use perturbation theory. And the perturbation series looks like this. This is the perturbation series. And I want you to notice that the ground state energy, which is a function of epsilon, if you write it down as a perturbation series in powers of epsilon, the coefficients are rapidly getting bigger. Okay, you notice three quarters, 21 eighths, 333 over 16. These coefficients are growing like n factorial. And you cannot sum the series. You, can, you're not, you cannot simply add up the terms in this series. This series diverges for all non-zero values of epsilon. Okay, so the question is, what do you do? Okay, and that's what this talk is about. Um, here is an outline of the talk that I'm going to be giving you. Um, it's in three parts. Uh, first is the beginning, which I've just given to you. 
Second is the middle and third is the end, okay? So there are really two problems in uh, summation theory. Uh, the first problem is what do you do if you have a convergent series, but it takes forever to add up the terms in the series? Okay, and this is often what happens when you're summing a series, even if it's convergent. You should never attempt to sum up the terms in a convergent series because you can get the sum of the series without summing up the terms, okay? And there are many techniques for doing so. One technique is called the Shanks transform. Another technique is called Richardson extrapolation. And there are many more techniques. If you would like to read about this, you can read this book, uh, Advanced Mathematical Methods for Scientists and Engineers. There is a whole chapter on uh, summation theory. You will learn a lot about it. Um, I'm not going to spend any time in this talk talking about these methods in detail because um, it'll take, I think, a little bit too much time. But these are interesting methods and they're easy to learn. Um, the second thing that I'm going to tell you about, and this is what this talk is going to be focused on, is how to use uh, techniques, how do you invent techniques, and these are asymptotic techniques, to sum a divergent series. And some of these, there, there are many techniques. Um, one technique, the, the simplest technique is called Euler summation. The next technique, very easy technique, is called Borel summation. There is something called generic summation, which I will teach you this is something that most people don't know anything about. Um, there is something called Pade theory. Pade theory is not completely understood. It's a very interesting technique, and we won't really have any time to talk about it in detail today, but it's something that uh, you should learn about. Um, so in the first technique, that is how to sum a series if it's convergent. One technique is called the Shanks transform. And this is a technique that you use if the terms in a series alternate in sign. For example, suppose you had the problem of adding up the series one minus a half plus a third minus a fourth plus a fifth. Now this series is a convergent series, but it converges so slowly that if you try to add it up on your computer, the computer can work all day and all night and maybe, maybe possibly be able to calculate just the first three or four terms in the decimal expansion. You might be able to get the number 0 0.6931, but that's about it. And then your computer will eventually die. Okay, now the exact sum of this series is log of two. And if you use the technique of Shanks transforming the series, you can, you, you can get the answer from just a few terms in the series. For example, if you just use, say, six terms in the series, you can get an answer which is accurate to which is, you know, the accuracy would be a, about 0.69313999, which is incredibly accurate. So the Shanks transform tells you the sum of the series using just the first few terms in the series. Okay, so remember, the series knows what it's going to converge to, but you don't. And the question is, can you persuade the series to tell you the sum without trying to add up millions and millions of terms in the series? And you can do that. In fact, if you use just eight terms in the series, just the first eight terms in the series, you can get the number 0.6931467. And the answer, the exact answer is 0.693. One four 
seven two. So your accurate your accuracy is just about one part in a million. Okay, which is terrific. Okay, now this is a technique that I'm not going to uh, describe to you in uh, today because there's just not enough time. But the technique is easy to learn, and I recommend you study it. Okay. I also mentioned a Shanks transform. Um, you can sum this series. You 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 can use the Shanks transform to sum an even more difficult series. Okay, this series is so slowly converging that you could never get anything close to the exact answer by simply adding up these terms one at a time on your computer. But if you use the Shanks transform, from just seven terms in the series, you can get this number. Okay, the exact answer is 0 0.604898. And from just the first seven terms in the series, I get the number 0 0.604898. Nine zero zero. So it's off by two parts in six hundred thousand. Now that's pretty good. Okay, I, I mentioned Richardson extrapolation, and this is what you do if you have a series where the terms do not alternate in sign; they're all one sign. Okay, and some of you may know the series one plus a quarter, plus a ninth, plus a sixteenth. So we're adding up one over one squared, plus one over two squared, plus one over three squared, plus one over four squared. And some of you may know the exact answer. This is the exact answer. The exact answer is pi squared over six. Okay, this is a beautiful series. But if you try to add this up, the series up on your computer, it will take you forever. Nevertheless, if you use Richardson extrapolation from just 25 terms in the series, you can get this result, which is accurate to one part in a trillion, okay, which is, you know, wonderful. But what I would like to focus on today is how to sum a series if it diverges. And I'm going to tell you about Euler summation and Borel summation and something that I'm going to call generic summation. But there is much more to learn. You have to learn about continued fractions and Pade theory and more. And all of this is very interesting. Um, not that much is known about it. This is um, an ongoing uh, study. Uh, 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 it's an ongoing branch of mathematics that's really interesting and fun to learn about. Okay, so here are some examples of divergent series. So a very simple uh, divergent series would be 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 and so on. What do you think the sum of this series is? Well, if you try to add up the terms in the series, you get one. And then if you add up the first two terms, you get zero. And if you add up the first three terms, you get one. And if you add up the first four terms, you get zero. So it, this series is not converging. And if you attempt to add up the terms in the series, it's not just that it will take a very, very long time for it to converge to an answer, it will never converge to an answer, never. Nevertheless, we can sum this, this divergent series and find the unique sum of this series. Now here is an even more difficult series to sum. What do you think the sum of one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32 and so on is, what is the sum of that series? That series is wildly divergent. The terms in this series are growing like two to the n. And if you attempt to add up the terms in the series, of course, you'll get infinity. 
one plus two plus four plus eight and so on gives you infinity. And the same is true with the series one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Okay, but in fact, this series and this series have a unique sum and you can find it. Um, here's another series that's very interesting. Take the series one plus zero plus minus one plus one plus zero minus one plus one plus zero minus one. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this series is exactly the same as this series, but it isn't. And that's quite remarkable. This series has a finite sum and it's easy to calculate the sum and I'll show you the techniques for doing so. But the sum of this series is not the same as the sum of this series. And here's another series, zero factorial minus one factorial plus two factorial minus three factorial and so on. This series, if you attempt to add up the terms in the series is wildly divergent because the numbers, numbers in the, the, the elements in the series, okay, the coefficients are growing like a factorial. But in fact, it's easy to add up the terms in this series and find the unique answer. Now, you may think that divergent series are bad things, but they're not bad. In fact, they're very useful and they appear all the time when we're solving problems in physics. And in fact, divergent series are, are useful. And when we use summation techniques, we typically find that divergent series converge faster than convergent series, which is a very interesting property. Okay. And some divergent series, you should be, of course, aware of this. It is true that some divergent series, a small number of them, actually add up to infinity. And that's okay. It's okay for the answer for the sum of a series that is divergent to add up to infinity. And an example of such a series is the series one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth. This series, people write this series as zeta of one. This is an example of a di divergent series that really adds up to infinity. Okay, not to a finite number, but the sum of this series, if we calculate it using sophisticated summation methods, is truly infinity. But it's actually very rare for a divergent series to add up to infinity. But actually, this fact is very useful. Um, let me show you an application of the fact that that series really does add up to infinity. Let's suppose you're a little kid and you're playing with blocks, okay? And you would like to make a tower out of blocks, okay? And your blocks have a length of two. So this is one of your toys, your toy blocks. And I'm gonna ask you a very simple question. If you pile these blocks on top of one another, how much of an overhang can you make before it falls down? In other words, can we put a block on top of this block and another block on top of that block and another block on top of that block? How much of an overhang here can you make before this falls down? Now let's see, let's see if we can do it in a very clever way. Remember that the center of mass of this block is right in the middle, okay? So there's one unit to this side of the block and one unit to this side of the block, okay? Now, if we want to start making an overhang, what should we do? We should put this block on top of this block so that it's exactly balanced right at the center of mass. This block will not fall down because it's sitting on the center of mass 
and it will not go down this way. It cannot fall down this way, and it certainly cannot fall down that way. Okay, so now we have an overhang of one. Now, remember that these two blocks together are a unit, and the center of mass of this unit is right here in the middle. Okay, so if we ask where is the center of mass of this unit, it is right here in the middle, one half a unit from this side, and 1.5 units from this side. So therefore, we can balance this right on top of another block, and it will not fall down. So this block is balanced on the center of mass, and these two blocks are balanced on this center of mass. And now we have an overhang of one plus a half. Okay, let's keep working. If we have four blocks, our overhang is now one plus a half plus a third. And if we keep piling blocks on top of more blocks and more blocks, always balancing the block exactly at the center of mass, we have an overhang. If we use an infinite number of blocks, the overhang will be one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth and so on. So if you're interested in an architecture and you want to build something that doesn't fall down without using glue or cement or anything like that, you can get an overhang of infinity and it will still not fall down, which is quite remarkable. Okay, so we've already learned a simple physical principle by adding up a series that diverges. Okay, we can build an overhang that will not fall down. And your bridge will look something like this. Okay, now it is important to remember that addition is not infinitely commutative. Okay, now when you were little children, you learned about the three laws of arithmetic. Remember, you learned about the commutative law and the associative law and the distributive law. The commutative law says that you can add up numbers in any order. That is, A plus B is the same as B plus A. And A plus B plus C is the, C, is the same as C plus A plus B. But addition is not infinitely commutative. It's only finitely commutative. So remember that I showed you that this series here adds up to uh, the log of two. Remember that? Uh, but if you add up the terms in this series in a different order, you can get a different number. For example, if I would like this series to add up to, say, 10, all I need to do is add up the positive numbers in this series, which is a divergent series adding up to infinity. And I keep adding up the positive numbers until I get something bigger than 10. Then I start adding up the negative numbers to make it something just below 10. And then I add up more positive numbers to make it bigger than 10. And I add up more negative numbers to make it just less than 10. And I keep going. And if I do the summation of the series uh, in that fashion, I can get this series to add up to 10. But what I've done, of course, is to commute the numbers in this series infinitely, infinitely far in the series. So we have to be very careful about understanding the commutative law. Okay, now let me um, teach you how to add up some divergent series. So the first person who told us a technique, who showed us a technique, for adding up the term uh, a divergent series was Euler, who's a very famous mathematician. 
hundreds of years ago. And this is what he said. He said, if you have this divergent series, all we need to do is to multiply the first term in the series by x to the zero power and the second term by x to the first power and the third term by x to the second power and so on. The next term by x cubed, the next term by x to the fourth. And that gives us this series. And now this series is a power series in x that converges so long as x is less than one. And you all know how to add up this series. This is a simple geometric series. And the sum of this series is one over one plus x. So Mr. Euler said, all we need to do is to let x approach one in order to recover the original series. And that is Euler's definition for the sum of this series. And if we let x approach one, we find that Euler's sum of the series is one half. And that's the correct answer. That is the sum of this divergent series. Okay, now, of course, if this is the first time you've learned about summation, you might say this is ridiculous, okay? Because you might be able to think of another way to sum this series and get a different answer, okay? And indeed, there are many ways to sum a divergent series, um, but we have learned something very interesting. What we've learned, if you go back and look at this series, we got the number one half. But you might think that the way to add this series is to use the associative law. That is, you might say one plus one is zero, so I will associate these two numbers and then I will add one. And now I get one. And then I will associate the first four numbers and I get zero again, and the first five numbers and get one. So what we've learned is that if the sum of the series is really one half, you cannot attempt to use the associative property of arithmetic. It's not, arithmetic is not infinitely associative you've used the method of associativity an infinite number of times, and that's not correct. So addition, remember, is not infinitely associative. So what we've learned is that arithmetic is not infinitely commutative, and it's not infinitely associative. Not if you want to do it an infinite number of times, and not if we're talking about infinite summation, infinite series. Okay, now let's do another problem. Let's use Euler's technique to sum that second series I showed you, one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 and so on. What would Euler do to sum this series? Well, he'd multiply this number by x to the zero, this number by x to the first power, this number by x to the second power, this number by x to the third power, this number by x to the fourth power, and so on. And then he would say, look, this is just a geometric series. I can sum this series. The sum of this series is one over one minus two x. And then Euler would say, all we need to do is to set x equal one to turn this series back into the series we're trying to sum. And if you set x equals one, you get minus one. So indeed, we have learned that the sum of this series is minus one. And that's the correct answer. The sum of that series is minus one. So this is very interesting. What you've learned is that an infinite sum of positive numbers can actually be a negative number. And that's true. Okay, so this is a divergent series. It has a sum according to Euler, and the sum of that series is minus one. Very, very interesting. So in other words, if you add up the terms in this series, you run off to infinity and you keep going 
and you start coming back from minus infinity all the way down to minus one. So this is a remarkable result. Okay, now later on, only a hundred years ago, um, a little over a hundred years ago, along come, comes another very clever mathematician and he develops a newer, more sophisticated way to sum a divergent series. And his technique uses a very simple identity. You've all taken calculus. You know that if you need to evaluate this integral, you know the technique for doing so. You use integration by parts. And if you use integration by parts, you immediately find that this integral is equal to n factorial. So if you were to take the ratio of this integral divided by n factorial, you would get one. So Mr. Burrell says, if you have a divergent series and you would like to find the sum of the series, which I will call B, this is what we should do. You should take the terms in your series, you have a, an infinite series, that is your problem is to add up the sum from zero to infinity of the numbers a sub n. And what Mr. Burrell says, take this series and change it into the series where you have the integral in the numerator and n factorial in the denominator and interchange summation and integration. So Burrell says, I haven't done anything. All I've done is taken a series A0 plus A1 plus A2 plus A3 and so on, and multiplied each of those numbers by this integral divided by n factorial. I haven't done anything. I've put one in every term in the series. And then the only thing I do is take that integral sign and pull it out front. Okay, that's all. So let's use Borel summation. Let's ask, what is the sum of minus one to the n? Okay, now we already showed using Euler's technique that the sum of the series is one half. Now, Mr. Borel says, take each of these terms in the series and multiply it by the integral of e to the minus x times x to the n and divide it by n factorial. So that's what I've done over here. And I've pulled the integral sign out of the sum and I have this series to add up. Now you recognize this series right away. This is the expansion of e to the minus x. So if I multiply this e to the minus x by this e to the minus x, I get e to the minus 2x. And when I do the integral, I get 1 half. Now that's remarkable. I invented another way to sum a diversion series, and I get the same answer. Why did we get the same answer? Is this just a coincidence, or is there something real going on here? Why do I get, of all possibilities, why do I get exactly the same answer if I use Euler's method and Borel's method? Is the sum of that series actually uniquely one half? So to answer that question, I'm going to invent a general method for summing a divergent series, okay? And my general method is called generic summation. So I'm going to invent a machine that will sum a divergent series, and I will call this machine G for generic summation, okay? And I don't know how this machine actually works. I have no idea how it works, but I'm going to require that this addition machine obey two simple axioms, okay? Two very simple axioms. The first axiom, is the axiom of addition. So what I mean by that is, if my machine, G, can add up this series, A plus B plus C plus D and so on, and get an answer, it should get the same answer 
as if I took off the first term in the series A and added up using my summation machine all the rest of the terms. Okay, so we can imagine this is a divergent series and we don't know how the machine will add up all these terms in the series, but I do require that if I remove the first term in the series and add it back to the sum of all the remaining terms in the series, I should get exactly the same answer as if this machine adds up all the terms in the series. Okay, so this is the axiom of addition. Now, the second axiom is this, it's the distributive law. So we know that we cannot infinitely commute the terms in the series or associate the terms in the series. But the third law of arithmetic is actually very powerful because, which is called the distributive law, because this law is really nothing but linearity. And what I'm telling you is this, Suppose I have a series A plus B plus C plus D, little d plus E. Suppose I were to sum up all the, that, this series and multiply that sum by X. And suppose I had another series, capital A plus capital B plus capital C plus capital D. And I, this series could well be divergent but I multiply all the numbers in this series by y, linearity, that is the distributive law says that if I sum up ax plus capital AY and little bx times capital BY and so on, I should get exactly the same answer, okay? So I don't know how my generic summation machine will work to add up a divergent series, but I do demand that this machine obey the axiom of addition and the axiom of linearity. These are two very basic mathematical concepts that are very powerful, and we're gonna require that this machine obey those two axioms. Now, let's use generic summation to sum up this divergent series, okay? So I don't know how this machine will work, but if it does work, it will tell me that the sum of this series is S. Now, what does axiom one tell me? It tells me that I can take this number one out of the series and put it out front and use my generic machine <clears throat> summation machine to add up all the remaining terms in this divergent series. And now I will use the axiom number two, which is the axiom of linearity, to pull out um, a factor of minus one from every term in that series. So this, by axiom number two, is the same as minus the sum of one minus one plus one minus one and so on. That's axiom number two. But wait a minute, this is the same as the original problem we had. And if this uh, summation machine is powerful enough, it will tell me that the sum of this series again is S. So now we know that S is equal to one minus S. And therefore S is one half, aha. So the answer is unique. It doesn't matter what summation technique so long we use, so long as that axiom tech, that, that addition technique, the summation technique obeys axiom number one and axiom number two. The answer will always be one half. And that's why Euler summation and Borel summation gave us the same answer. Okay, now there is an even more powerful technique and this is called zeta summation. And this, is this uses the theory of complex variables. And I am not going to assume that you have learned the theory of complex variables. Some of you may have, and some of you may not. 
But complex variable theory tells you how, how to add up this series, okay? And this is, this is a, a function called the zeta function. Now, I'm not gonna describe this to you, but I did show you zeta of one, and I told you that the answer is infinity. But zeta of zero gives you the series one plus one plus one plus one, if s equals zero here. And the sum of this series happens to be minus one half. And the sum of this series, if s equals minus one, that's the series one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six. This is another divergent series. And the sum of this series is minus one twelfth. Okay, now you may think, wow, this is interesting, but this is just mathematical games. The question is, if I'm a physics student, is this important to me? And the answer is yes, because divergent series like this appear all the time when you do physics problems, okay? And a remarkable early application of this goes back to Casimir. This is Casimir. He lived from 1909 to the year 2000. He died only very recently. And he discovered the Casimir force. And I'm gonna briefly tell you about this before I end my talk. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the talk, but here is um, uh, an example of the Casimir force. Imagine you have two metal plates. Now, if there were an electrical charge on these plates, these plates would feel an electrical force between them that might uh, give you a force of attraction or a force of re repulsion, okay? but what we are going to do here is we're going to consider two metal plates that have no electrical charge. And what Casimir realized is that if you have two uncharged electrical plate, uh, metal plates, conducting metal plates, there is still a force between them. Now, why is that? Because even if there is no charge on the plates, the theory of quantum uh, electrodynamics says that there are always virtual electrons that appear and disappear in the vacuum. So the vacuum has no charge, but there are virtual electrons. And these uh, virtual electrons tell you that there are standing waves between the plates, like the standing waves on a guitar string or on a violin string. Okay, there are also waves outside of the plates that begin at the plates and go off to infinity and begin at this plate and go off to infinity. Now, what Casimir says is, suppose we separate the plates, suppose we move the plates apart or a little bit closer together. The waves outside the plates don't change because we haven't changed the distance to infinity. It's still an infinite distance from this plate out to infinity and this plate out to infinity. But the standing waves between the plates change. They have a different frequency. So the modes are slightly different and we can add up the energy in those modes. So we put the plates this close together and add up the energy between the two plates. And then we move them a little bit. And again, we add up the energy between the plates. Now, when we add up the energy between the plates, we have to add up a divergent infinite series. But we now know how to do that, okay, using, in fact, zeta summation. And then what we do is we ask, what is the difference in the energy? And the energy is slightly different. And we remember from freshman physics that the derivative of the energy is the negative of the force. So if we separate the plates by an amount dx and then divide the change 
in the force, in, in the change in the energy, okay, by, you, by summing a divergent series, and then take the ratio of delta E divided by delta X, that tells us the force between the plates. And this force can actually been, be married, measured in a laboratory, and it's been done before. Recently, it's, it's actually an experiment that you can do. But in fact, this has a classical um, uh, application as well. And if you want to see the classical application, <clears throat> not just the quantum application, all you have to do is to see the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Now, some of you may have seen this movie, and this is a dramatic example of the Casimir force, okay? So we don't just have to have a metal plate. We could have two boats in the water. And in between the two boats, there are standing waves. And because of those standing waves in the water, this, these are classical waves, because of the change in the energy, the total energy contained in those standing waves, there is a force between two boats, always. And that force is a force of attraction. And that's why if we have two boats parallel to one another, we are always very careful to put something between those boats so that they don't crash into one another because of the Casimir force. <coughs> and if you uh, see the movie, you will see Indiana Jones. This is Indiana Jones over here, who's escaping from the people who are pursuing him, the dangerous people who are pursuing him, them, okay? And they have guns. So Indiana Jones also has a gun over here, okay? And he's got a girlfriend, of course. And this girlfriend is trying to help him escape from the bad guys who are behind him. Now, if you see the movie, you will also learn that his girlfriend is also bad, but never mind, okay? Right now, she's trying to help Indiana Jones escape in this boat. And ahead of them are two boats that are parallel to one another. And here is Indiana Jones in this boat. And here's the girlfriend driving the boat. And Indiana Jones knows about the Casimir force. And he yells at his girlfriend, don't go between the boats. But the motor of the boat is making so much noise that she can't hear him. Okay, he says, don't go between the boats, we'll get killed, we'll die. And she says, I can't hear you. There's too much noise. What? Go between the boats? Are you crazy? You should never go between the boats. That's what she says. But she says, okay, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. So she goes between the boats. And the boats are coming together, but they just barely make it. And the bad guys behind them do not get between the boats. They chase them right after, they, they're chasing right after the boats come together and there's a big explosion and the bad guys get killed. Okay, so Indiana Jones knows a lot of physics but he just barely escapes and the guys behind him don't, okay? So there's one last technique, which I'm not going to explain to you because it takes too much time and it requires knowledge of uh, complex variable theory, but it is called Pade summation. And you should learn about it because I'm gonna show you how powerful it is, okay? so. You remember at the beginning of my lecture, this is an organized lecture, at the beginning of the talk, I said that the ground state energy of the anharmonic oscillator perturbation series, that series begins one half plus three quarters minus 20, 21 eighths 
plus 333 over 16, multiplying this small parameter, okay? And if you look at more terms in the series, they, the terms get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And these terms are growing like n factorial. If you didn't know how to sum a divergent series and you added up this series, you would get a ridiculous answer, okay? You would get infinity, okay? But if you use Pade theory, okay, if you just add up the series, you get the number that just that, the, that, that short beginning of the series, just that partial sum of the series, you would get eight times 10 to the eighth power, which is ridiculous, okay? But if you use Pade to sum that series, as you take more and more terms in the series, the Pade sum gives you a set of numbers which go, which are a little small, and then they get big and small and big and small and big and small. And the Pade technique gives you a sequence of numbers which is oscillating closer and closer and closer and closer to the exact answer. And it is now just a few percent off from the exact answer. And you can prove rigorously that when you sum that divergent series, you get the exact answer to the quantum problem. Okay, so if you don't know how to sum a divergent series, you really cannot solve problems in quantum mechanics. But if you knew, if you do know how to learn, if you do know how to sum a divergent series, then you can solve difficult quantum problems exactly. Okay, so that's all. I hope you found this interesting. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Uh, I think you should go away and think about divergent series. They're strange animals, but if you learn about them, it will make you very powerful as a researcher in physics. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Professor, for your talk. Uh, it was very engaging to have you here. Uh, now, if time permits, I guess we can take some questions. Sure, I'd be happy to do so. Um, unfortunately, I, I can only barely hear, I can't, cannot hear the question. Um, is it possible to send it to me in a chat or to write it down or something? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor. It was a very yeah. wonderful talk. So I have a uh, question. At the beginning of your lecture, you uh, uh, give uh, gave some equations, suppose x to the power five plus epsilon x equal to one, and then assume, uh, can you hear professor? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Yeah, at the beginning, I'm just going back to the beginning of the lecture. Yeah. Um, you said I showed you some series, yeah. X to the power five plus epsilon x equal to one, the first equation that you considered. Oh, oh, so you want to talk, you want to- yeah, 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 the basic first equation. Back back here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're talking about this problem. Yes, so mm -hmm. basically, uh, so basically it is like some, suppose given some f of x, we need to solve fx. And so we determine some function, say g of x comma epsilon equal to zero, and then solve by perturbation series. So right. uh, I want to ask, so is there some criteria for the function g of x epsilon to be written as a Taylor series in epsilon, like suppose a, a series in epsilon, because it basically means uh, it is some geometric curve in epsilon. So is it always possible to write g x epsilon as some geometric curve in epsilon? Um, so this is a very interesting question. It is actually a very hard question. Um, what you're asking me is, Whenever I have any kind of um, mathematics problem, like um, you, you want to use the function g of x. So it, you're asking me if I have an, a very difficult algebraic problem, 
of it's solving the equation g of x equals zero, what what is x? That's your question. Uh, yes, um, basically yes. Uh, so is it always possible to give a geometric series? Uh, it is a geometric curve in epsilon, basically. Yes. So so, always... Yes. So in general, it is not always uh, simple. Um, in fact, the the general question of how you solve. I mean, what you're asking me is uh, a problem that let, let, let's write it down. You're asking me, I'll tell you what, let me, let me close just a second. Let me um, stop my sharing. Okay, so now um, you can see me better, I think. Um, so what you're asking me is, if I have an equation like that, g of x equals zero, is there a way is there a way to solve this equation by inserting an epsilon? And then and considering then, the expansion in epsilon. Right. So you would like to in, say, you would, you're, you're asking, what is x? OK. And yeah. you would like to find some sort of series like this to calculate x. And in fact, this involves a lot of art because there is certainly not a unique way to do this. There are many ways to do it. Um, I can give you, uh, so this, this takes a lot of experience because there some ways are better, some ways are not so good, okay? And uh, what you do is you begin by saying, is you have to look at this function g of x, okay? And you have to see, are there ways to insert an epsilon that will simplify this equation when epsilon equals zero, okay? So what I did was to say, g of x in this case uh, is the equation x to the five um, plus x uh, minus one and you're, you're solving in, in the example I showed you, you were, we were solving this equation here, okay? And we looked at the equation and we said, aha, we can make that equation simpler if we put an epsilon, say, over here, like this. If we put an epsilon right in front of this term, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or, then I said, but wait a minute, there's another way. We can put an epsilon in front of this term. Yes. Sir. This term led to a divergent series, and this term, putting epsilon in here, led to a convergent series. And sometimes the divergent series is very difficult to sum. Sometimes the con convergent series is very difficult to sum. So this takes a lot of experience and intuition. And this is a very non-trivial problem in general. And let me actually show you another way that I didn't talk about of putting epsilon in, which is extremely interesting, okay? Another way to put an epsilon into this problem is to consider the following. We can put an epsilon in this way, <laughs> okay? And this is really interesting. Okay, so in order to recover the original problem, epsilon has to be equal to four. You understand, right? Yes, yes. yes. On the other hand, if epsilon equals zero, we can solve this problem, okay? Yes. Because that, is, that's the, that gives you a trivial equation, just x plus x, you know, minus one equals zero, so x equals one half. Okay, so we, so we can study um, this problem, okay? And if we do, we will find that the radius of convergence of the perturbation series is exactly one. 
But we want to sum the series when x equals 4. So once yes. again, we get a divergent series. But it turns out that if we use summation theory to sum that series, we can get the answer to the problem. And we can get the answer even more accurately, that is, more rapidly than the other two methods, which is remarkable. OK, so there are many ways in that you can put an epsilon into a hard problem to reduce it to a problem you can solve when epsilon equals zero, and then do perturbation theory. <coughs> and, and this is an open question. I mean, there are, there are so many ways, there are probably an infinite number of ways, that this is a wonderful and interesting uh, thing to study. Okay, even simple algebraic problems like this, like this simple, you know, quintic equation here can become extraordinarily interesting as soon as we try to do perturbation theory. Okay, so in fact, let me just say something personally. When I was a student like you, I took a course in quantum mechanics. And I remember that toward the end of the course, the um, professor said to me, um, uh, you said to the class, of course, said, uh, of course, we have been solving exactly solvable problems in this course. We have solved the harmonic oscillator. We have solved the hydrogen atom. We have solved the square well problem. These are all problems that you can solve exactly. But uh, if you go on in physics, you will be trying to solve problems that don't have exact solutions. What um, should you do, you should do perturba perturbation theory. And if you do perturbation theory, then you will be able to solve approximately very hard problems. And he proceeded <coughs> to show us a little bit of perturbation theory. He did uh, the Born approximation, okay, which is first order perturbation theory, which you may have learned about. Um, but he never gave us he never told us the truth. And the truth is that almost always perturbation theory gives you a divergent series. And without knowing summation theory, perturbation theory is of no use to you at all. But if you learn summation theory, then you are now powerful because you can solve really hard problems in physics. That is really hard problems means problems that do not have an exact closed form solution. And that's why you have to learn summation theory. Okay, I'm sorry, you, you had a further question. Yeah, I was asking, so uh, suppose given the function f of x equal to zero, so is mm -hmm. it always possible to uh, write x as a perturbation series is there some criteria that it must fulfill? There's not a universal criteria. Okay, so in general, you have to use your creativity and your imagination to find out exactly which way to insert an epsilon into the problem. The, the chances are there, it, there is always at least one way which is very powerful and will help you solve the problem. Okay, almost always. However, it will take a lot of uh, experience and creativity um, to think of a powerful way to solve a problem. For example, using this technique might not have come to you right away. Yes. Okay, this is a very, very difficult technique. Let me, let me take a moment and give you an example Okay, um, um, a very powerful, a very difficult problem in physics um, would be solving the equation, um, is solving something called the Thomas Fermi equation. The Thomas Fermi equation describes uh, an atom, okay, and it gives you, it, it attempts to 
calculate the radius of the atom. That is, you have an electron going around a nucleus, okay? And you wanna figure out the physical size of this, this atom, okay? And the Thomas Fermi equation uses something called a semi-classical approximation, and it comes up with this differential equation. Okay, now I'm gonna show it to you. This is the differential equation, okay? So it is a, uh, X is the radius of the atom. It's the radial variable. We can think of it as R, okay? And you have to solve, the problem is to solve this differential equation, it's a second order nonlinear differential equation because this is why the solution to the equation to the three halves power. No one has ever found an exact solution to this equation. It's very difficult and you have to solve it subject to boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are y of zero equals one and y of infinity equals zero. <clears throat> okay, that's, that's the, those are the boundary conditions. If you could solve this equation exactly, um, you not only should publish it immediately, you should publish your solution immediately, but you will probably get a prize. Okay, because this is a really difficult equation. Okay, the solution is easy to plot, or not easy, but you can plot it on a computer and the solution, let me do it in a different color. The solution starts at one and it gradually falls to zero like that. Okay, so it doesn't do anything, you know, radical. It doesn't, doesn't do strange things. It doesn't oscillate. It's a very smooth solution that falls off to zero and indeed, the density of electrons around an atom gradually falls off to zero as you, as you go off to infinity, okay? The question is, can you find an approximate solution to this equation? And a really cool way of doing it is to, is to do perturbation theory. And the question is, how would you do perturbation theory for this problem? Okay, and it's not at all obvious how to do it. Let me show you a really cool way to do it. Okay, so how do we put in an epsilon? So we, so we write down the equation y prime prime equals y <clears throat> So we solve this equation. So the original equation we had was y prime prime equals y to the three halves over the square root of x, right? Yeah. A yes. neat way to put an epsilon would be like this. Why is that? Because if epsilon equals zero, the equation you have to solve is y prime prime equals y, and you know how to solve that equation, in fact, the solution to this equation that satisfies those boundary conditions is y of x equals e to the minus x. And e to the minus x looks very much like what you're looking for. Okay, this looks like a solution e to the minus x, but now what we wanna do is let epsilon equal one half to get the answer to the problem. So we do perturbation theory in powers of epsilon and we try to sum that series and that series of course is going to be a divergent series but we use summation theory and in fact on the back of an envelope I can get the answer to this problem accurate to about 1% right away. Okay and in fact it, it once occurred to me to do this while I was sitting in a lecture and while I was sitting in the lecture, I had an envelope. So I was able to write on the back of the envelope and solve the problem accurately to just about 1%.
okay, which is wonderful. And uh, you can do this. Uh, I mean, perturbation theory is very powerful, but it is not at all obvious. And it wasn't at all obvious to put an epsilon up in the exponent. And that is art, okay? That it requires a certain amount of art and creativity. And that's why physics involves a lot of intuition and a lot of elegance and a lot of artistic creativity. This is, this is, this is, you know, this is interesting. That's why physics is fun and it's non-trivial. Okay, so these are techniques for solving very, very hard problems. <clears throat> uh, thank you, sir. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, sir, we also have one more question. A few more questions after. If that's time, really. If, if it is time, sir, we have a question. Uh, I can't. Uh, there's something wrong. I can't quite hear you. Oh, now I can. Now I can hear you. Uh, there are a few more questions. So okay. Uh, thank you for being patient with us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, hello. Um, thank you for your wonderful lecture. So uh, just, uh, I want to know, as you know, in quantum field theory, in vacuum, uh, either QED or QCD, we know mm -hmm. two-point function, four-point function, et cetera, et cetera, diverges. And great people in quantum field theory, as well as in mathematics, they have norm renormalized it. And finally, through the either counter term technique or through some other technique, uh, they have removed the divergence and finally the series converges and which gives the physical values of mass and charge of this electron. Well, the series doesn't converge. What renormalization does, so, so, so what renormalization does is make each term in the series finite, but the series doesn't converge. Okay, so, so it's, it's important to, um, so let me just say, if we were solving, um, if we were solving a quantum field theory, like, you know, if, if we have a, a, a phi to the four quantum field theory. Yeah, theory, yeah, that is the starting point. That is the EGS field theory. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So we have some Hamiltonian that looks like grad phi squared, you know. Minus minus m square phi square and plus or minus because we can huh. be in euclidean space or okay. Space, okay. But okay. so <clears throat> um so if we have a hamiltonian that looks something like this yes 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 okay yes. so this is a free theory and this is the phi to the four term okay, okay. the point is if we do, uh, and of course, the reason that I showed you the anharmonic oscillator is that that is a one-dimensional field theory. Okay. Exactly, okay. that is what I asked you. Okay. okay. No, of course. Okay. So, so uh, in quantum field theory, this is like the anharmonic oscillator, but it's okay. in higher dimensional space. Okay. okay, yeah. So what we would normally do is perturbation theory in powers of G. Yes. If we do perturbation theory in powers of G, we, we obtain uh, Feynman diagrams. <clears throat> and these Feynman diagrams that we get, most of them are actually divergent. Yes. Okay, so each term, so what is remarkable, what is different about quantum field theory compared with what I've been talking about today is that in this case, not only does the perturbation series diverge as a series, but each term in the perturbation series is also in infinity. Yes, yes. <laughs> so as a mathematical problem, this is really difficult. However, uh, Feynman and Schwinger and Tamanaga uh, got the Nobel Prize for renormalization. 
And they showed in the context of uh, quantum electrodynamics that renormalization will make each term in the perturbation series finite, but the perturbation series still diverges. And in fact, my term. yes. But the sum of the series is still infinity. Okay, if you just add up the terms in the series. And in fact, uh, when I was a postdoc, I wrote a paper showing that this was the case. <laughs> and so you still have to learn how to sum that divergent series. Okay, and um, and that is why we still have to learn methods like Pade theory and Borel summation and so on to learn how to sum that series. Um, furthermore, one other remark, in the case of this standard theory, if we want to solve this theory, we don't necessarily have to do a, a perturbation expansion in powers of G. Instead, what we can do is we can write down G uh, phi to the four, in this, in this problem, we can replace this by, <clears throat> we can replace that by G, the same G times phi squared times phi squared to the epsilon. Yes. And yes. we can expand an epsilon. Yes. Notice that when epsilon is equal to zero, if epsilon is zero, then we have a free theory, which we can yes. solve. Yes. And we can get, we can develop series and powers of epsilon, okay? That's an interesting way of doing perturbation theory. And an even more interesting way <laughs> of doing perturbation theory is to consider the theory G times, um, phi squared, or let me, G times phi squared times I phi to the epsilon, okay? okay? G times phi squared times I phi to the epsilon. And this is even more interesting because when epsilon is equal to two, we get a phi to the four theory, but it's a different theory because there's an I here, so it is a minus phi to the four theory. <laughs> and this is um, called a PT symmetric theory. And although it is a minus phi to the four theory, it has a ground state, a stable ground state. And even though it's an upside down potential, the, eigen, the energy levels are all strictly positive and real which is remarkable, okay? But such a theory can only be understood in a perturbative, using perturbative, you can only do calculations by, you know, using techniques of perturbation theory and summation theory. So this is a very subtle and interesting problem. Okay, so my next thing for my, uh, on the behalf of my students, as mm -hmm. you know, if you will go to field theory to finite temperature, when the field theory is in a medium, either mm -hmm. in thermal bath or heat reservoir, we know that uh, this normal perturbation quantum field theory breaks down. Yes. Because uh, breaks down. So because of infrared divergence. So those things, uh, some great people uh, that... Uh, mm, uh, some great people, they have developed a method around 90s, Bratton and Pisarsky. I think maybe you might have heard their name. They have oh, developed a scheme. Not just that. Not just that. Pisarsky is an old friend of mine. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. They fact, have developed a resummation technique to control that divergence. So my uh, query to you that uh, as, as we go for resummation, uh, does we uh, get rid of some degrees of freedom because it is an effective field theory? 
the, yeah. the some field theory is an effective field theory. Effective field theory means you are cutting some degrees of freedom. So, right. uh, so now my thing, the way you have told this one hour different kind of summation technique. So where can we preserve this uh, modularity of this field? Suppose in case of field theory. Uh, yeah. So, so the always the, the the technique when you're dealing with um, hard problems, problems that you cannot solve exactly. The problem always in when you're doing you know mathematical physics when when you're using mathematical techniques the technique is always to take the original problem which is an infinitely difficult problem it's a hopeless problem that you can never solve exactly okay and to reduce it down to a sequence of finitely difficult problems problems you can solve either really solve or at least solve in principle, <clears throat> maybe solve by a computer or maybe even solve analytically. And then to try to approach your limiting answer, you, you try to get as close as possible to the limiting answer where, um, wh which is you know getting closer and closer to the problem that you cannot solve exactly, okay? And indeed, when you reduce a problem to a sequence of problems, which is what Pizarski is doing and which is what you do when you do ordinary Feynman perturbation theory, you have a sequence of problems that are getting closer and closer and closer to reality, closer, closer to the actual physical reality, the physical problem you're trying to solve. Whenever you do that, um, what you find in general, is that very often the approximants are, even though they are appear to be coming physically closer to the answer, may be diverging mathematically away from it. Okay, and that almost always happens. And that says that what you are doing is not a regular approximation, but it is a singular approximation. In perturbation theory, in general, you are almost always doing singular perturbation theory. And what that means is that you have introduced singularities in the complex epsilon plane. And these singularities are interfering with your ability to approximate the exact answer. And the problem is, how do you evade these singularities? That's the general problem. And summation theory is a technique for evading the singularities that you personally introduced into the problem in order to make progress mathematically in solving that problem. Okay, and that's, so I've just given you a very small taste of what you need to do if you're a mathematical physicist to control the uh, approximation that you're using. Now, you know, I don't know if we can use uh, in the case of uh, infrared divergences, because that's your original question. I don't know uh, whether or not, for example, um, Borel summation or Pade theory will work directly to solve the kinds of difficulties that you get. Yes, it solved uh, indirectly through the QC, some rule. Some rule is a one way of Borel approximation scheme or Pade right. approximation, yes. Right, right. So, so you know, you, you never know whether or not it's tech, a technique like Pade is going to work. Um, in some cases, you can actually prove rigorously that Pade theory will converge to the exact answer. Okay, and in the case of uh, in in the case of the see, I wrote down well in the case of the anharmonic oscillator, um, you can prove rigorously that Pade approximation 
will take a divergent series and give you a set of approximate answers that really rigorously converge to the exact answer to the problem, okay, which is beautiful, okay? However, it's not always possible to do this. I mean, we're dealing, you and I are solving very difficult problems in physics and especially in higher dimension where you simply cannot do rigorous mathematics. It's, it's, it's too difficult. And so you do the best you can. That is, you calculate approximates, you look at the sequence of approximates you're getting, you see whether or not they appear to be getting closer and closer to the answer. Um, I can show you many examples of problems where we are calculating a special function like a Bessel function or a gamma function, say, and where we use Pade theory to sum a divergent series approximation, say, to the gamma function, like the Stirling series. And it works, but nobody has proved that it works. <laughs> so, so even in simple examples like that, it is very hard to prove that Pade theory is going to work. So what do we do? We try it anyway. And to our amazement, we find that it almost always works. <laughs> and it's, you know, why is this? It's a little bit magical. Uh, we have to have some belief, some confidence that techniques like this are going to work. And if they seem to be working, they probably are. I mean, you know, physics is very difficult. Mathematical physics is a very interesting field. It's interesting because the problems are hard and non-trivial. That's why they're fun to work on. And also okay. physical. And, the, also and physical. yes, yes, you're exactly right. Not only are they fun to work on, but they actually describe physical reality. Yes. yes. And that's, a, of course, that, that's what makes physics in my opinion, more interesting ma than pure mathematics because, because reality is what we are trying to describe. We're not just making up a, a, a game and trying to solve it. We're actually trying to understand the world around us, which is, which is very, very exciting, right? That's the point. Uh, yes, Professor, I have so many questions. But I want to uh, ask some my last question. As you know, yeah. in realistic case, you have to solve the effective field theory. Gauge field theory does not work in the real life, real life. So as you know, in all effective field theory, the operators which are high dimension operator, they are highly divergent. So, but we used to calculate physical quantity. Does it make any sense or we are missing something seriously? Usually in physics community, we don't bother about this divergence part. We keep on calculating some physical quantities, although those operators are highly divergent operators. Does it mm -hmm. make any sense? Because sometimes back AP Balchandran from Syracuse, he, he is also from physics background. But he told that sometimes physics people are doing some serious mistake, although they are not aware of this fact. So can we oh, make some comment? I, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> it, you, you are putting me in the position of expressing, expressing a sort of opinion about. Um, I, and the answer is. Not so opinion, all, what I'm trying to ask that is it necessary always to know this uh, summation of the divergent series or without knowing much fully, can we predict some physical quantities? So in other way, this is my question. That's, well, the answer is, um, if you didn't know any technique, any, uh, um, let, let me actually give you a, a specific answer. If you didn't know um, anything about summation theory, but you did know <clears throat> how to do perturbation theory, approximation theory, so you don't know how to sum a divergent series, and you do not know anything about Pade theory or Borel summation, 
and you start solving a problem approximately, okay? And you get, and so you are calculating the answer, which is a physical answer. That's the answer you're looking for. And the answer is a function of epsilon. Yes. Okay, so you, you begin your calculation and you find that the answer has the form uh, A plus B epsilon plus C epsilon squared and so on. Okay, and this, let's say you are only able to calculate three terms in your perturbation series because it's much too difficult to evaluate huge Feynman diagrams. And so you stop work. You just are not strong enough. So, <clears throat> so you know that there are infinitely many corrections to your calculator. Yes, yes, yes. But you have calculated only a few terms. And that's because you're a human being and you only have a finite amount of time and a finite amount of strength. Okay. The point is, almost always, this is a divergent series. However, this divergent series here may well be asymptotic to the answer. And what that means is that if epsilon is a very small parameter, okay, small is a relative issue because for each different series, what you mean by small is different. So we don't know, for example, whether or not 0.1 is a small number. Is one over 137 a small number? We don't know. Exactly, yes. Okay, however, however, in the case of electrodynamics, one over 137, even though the perturbation series you're calculating is divergent, one over 137 is small. And what that says is that the first few terms in your perturbation series will be a pretty good approximation to the exact answer you are looking for. However, if you work very hard and you calculate many more terms in this series, the answer will get your calculation will get closer to the exact answer for a while. And then as you add more and more terms, it will get worse. Okay, so typically what you see is something like this. So the exact answer, let's say, is here. This is the exact answer, and you start calculating more and more terms in your perturbation series. And what you typically find is that your answer gets closer and then gets worse. This is, this is typically what happens. As you calculate more and more terms, you get very close to your answer, if this is electrodynamics, say, and then it goes away. Okay, so if you are happy enough here, you stop and you say, <clears throat> I have been a successful physicist. Okay, but what we are interested in is whether or not we can actually calculate the exact answer. And if you take this series and you use a summation method, typically what you find is that when you sum the series, you will get something like this, <clears throat> your approximants will get very, very close to the answer and will actually converge to it, okay? So that's, you know, so sometimes you're lucky and without knowing anything about summation theory, you get pretty close to the answer and that's what you're saying, you know, some calculations appear to be pretty good. But the question is, why stop there? Why not try to use summation methods and extract all of the information in your divergent series 
and let it tell you about the exact answer you're looking for. Okay. Now, of course, you're not always lucky. In some cases, the perturbation theory starts out by being terrible and it gets worse and worse from there. But in electrodynamics, you're lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, perturbation theory is good for a while, but we know from what Dyson told us back in the 1950s that it is guaranteed to get worse. Yes. We know that the perturbation series is going to be eventually, it's, it's going to become disastrous. Mm -hmm. And that's why we learn about perturbation theory and how to sum it, okay? We don't just stop with our perturbative calculations, we actually process them, okay? That's the point, that we want to extract all the information. And remember, all the information is typically there in the early terms in the series. And can we extract that information from those early terms in the series? That's the real, that's the problem we are talking about when we do summation theory. The terms know what the answer is going to be <clears throat> and they don't, they're not nasty. They don't want to fool you. And they're, if you use the right technique, the, the right technique, you can extract the correct information from the early terms in a perturbation series. That's always what we have in mind. Don't just sum the series. That's a clumsy way to try to get information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Wonderful. Sure. Thank My you. pleasure. <clears throat> uh, Thank you, Professor. And yeah. if you have some time, I have my query of my own. If you can answer you, that. You have, uh, you, uh, sure, I'm happy to spend some more time. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, wait a second. Uh, okay. Uh, my query is a bit general one. Like, uh, how do we connect two no the two notions of summation, like the general intuitive notion we have for finite sums? And then we have one for the infinite and diverging sums. How do we connect them on a physical or more intuitive level? Like uh, for the finite case, you know that it makes physical sense. However, in case of infinite and diverging uh, sums, the connection to physical reality is there, but it's not apparent. But uh, one assumes that diverging series sum to infinity in the traditional sense. However, this sum, to be some finite value, which have some physical significance as pointed by you in the example of Casimir effect. So do you ever have any insight? How can we connect these two notions? Well, when you say, how can we connect them? What you're saying is <clears throat> what you always do to solve a hard problem is to convert the answer to an infinite series. That's what you always do. Okay. And the terms in that infinite series are supposed to add up. The terms in that infinite series are supposed to, if you add up that series, are supposed to give you the exact answer. Okay. Now, if that infinite series is convergent, then you can add up that series on a computer and get the exact answer. Okay. So the first half of summation theory tells you that it is silly, it is actually a waste of time to simply add up the terms in that infinite series and get the right answer. Because the series already knows a lot about the exact answer in the first few terms. So there is a way to accelerate what the series is telling you. Let me give you a simple ex example. Have you learned about Fourier series? Yes, sir. Yes, good. Okay. So when you solve a problem and express the answer as a Fourier series, that Fourier series may be exactly equal to the answer you are looking for. Yes. But... If you try to add up that Fourier series to find the exact answer, it will take forever. 
typically that Fourier series is extremely slowly convergent. And it may not even be convergent. Okay, if it's in many cases, when you use a Fourier series, it doesn't even converge. It may give you the answer zero <laughs> when the answer is not zero. Uh, and it may give you the answer infinity. Okay, so, so although the series represents the answer, it may not be equal to the answer in the following sense. If we only think of a series as a bunch of terms to be added together, okay, then that's a very naive way of looking at that series. So what I'm telling you is that there is a whole branch of mathematics where what it tries to do is look at the terms in the series. Remember that the series is not trying to fool you because the series may actually converge to the answer, but it is taking forever to do it, okay? And this is true of the series one minus a half plus a third minus a fourth plus a fifth. That series converges to the log of two, which is 0.693, okay? But if you actually really try to add up that series on your computer, you can't do it. Your computer, will just give you partial sums that are oscillating about the correct answer, but do not converge to 0.693 unless you let your computer run for weeks and weeks and weeks. And even after that, you will only get maybe four or five decimal places accuracy, and that's all. The point about summation theory is that those early numbers and those early terms in the series actually know what the series is going to converge to. And we can tease them, we can massage them and, and make friends with them, okay? And we can process that series and, you, and extract the answer with tremendous accuracy from say just 10 terms in the series. So if you give me the series one minus a half plus a third minus a fourth, I can take the first 10 terms and tell you the sum of the series accurate easily to 10 decimal places. Okay, yes, just by using a technique, say called Shanks uh, transformation. And a Shanks transformation is something that a beginning undergraduate can do. It's very simple, it's not, it's not deep. It's very simple and very easy. And I can find the sum of the series because the early terms in the series already know what they're going to converge to. And you just have to speak to them and let them tell you where they're trying to go, okay? But if you just say, oh, I see a plus sign between every term in the series. So therefore I'm just gonna add it up. That's not a good idea, <laughs> okay? Now, what I did was I went even further in my talk because that series may not converge, it may actually diverge. And if you really do just add up the terms in the series, it will give you infinity. And almost certainly, infinity is not the sum of that series. There is, even in the case of a divergent series, the sum of the series is actually a finite number. Okay, and the terms in the series know what that finite number is, but they're not telling you because all you're doing is adding them up. So we know again how to take the terms in those series and massage them, make friends with them, okay, and process them and get the series to tell you what it is truly representing. And for example, the series you know, as I showed you, the series one plus two plus four plus eight, the terms in that series know what they are trying to converge to, but they can't. Because if you add it up on a, on a computer, you get infinity, okay? They are actually converging to minus one. <laughs> okay? Yes. And a, a simple way 
I will give you a simple way to think about it. You know, why is it that they're converging to minus one? That's crazy. Okay. And the answer is this. This is the real number line. Okay. And here is zero over here. Okay. You can see that. Yes, sir. Yes, I can. Yeah. See. Okay. So instead of thinking about the real number line as a line, okay, in other words, you, you are adding up the numbers on the real number line. I'll put them in red. You are adding up a bunch of numbers that are all positive, okay? And they're over here. And th th this is the real, these are the numbers and you're adding up these numbers and they are appear to, the, as you add them up, the partial sums are going to infinity. But are they really going to infinity? Well, what we know is that we can map the real number line uh, onto a circle. Yes, sir. Okay, and the way we do it is, um, we draw a circle here. Okay, and the North Pole is right over here. That's, that's the North Pole, okay? Yes. And we know that we can associate every number on that line with a point on that circle. Yes, sir. Okay, and the way we do it is to draw a line from the North Pole We draw, we, we take a line on the, uh, we take a, a number on this real number line and we draw a line from the North Pole to that point. And we associate this point over here, <coughs> associate this point over here on the real number line with a point on the circle. Yes, sir. Okay, and now we ask what is happening as, we add up these numbers, these, these positive numbers, one plus two plus four plus eight and so on. They are giving me a sequence of numbers on the circle. And as we go off to infinity, what is happening with the partial sums of these numbers is that they are walking around They are walking around on this circle and they are going like this. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. And they are, they are, the partial sums correspond to numbers going around the circle. And eventually those numbers converge, even though they don't converge on the real line, they're converging on the circle and they converge to some point over here. And now if we ask, what is the real number that is associated with this point over here? We find that by drawing a line from the North Pole to here, okay? And we find that it converges, the sum of the series converges to minus one. It's in that sense that we are, we are doing some higher level mathematics and we are understanding that a bunch of positive numbers, when you add up these positive numbers, um, give you a bunch of partial sums that are getting bigger and bigger, faster and faster, so fast that the partial sums are going around the circle to here and that the sum of the series is actually a negative number. And indeed, in physics, the sum of those positive numbers, when you add them up, give you a Casimir force, which is negative. The plates are attracting each other. So a bunch of positive numbers, when you add them up, give you a negative answer. That's amazing. 
Okay. So it does seem magical. So, 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 yes. And so the whole idea is actually un understanding why it's a negative number requires that you understand complex variable theory. Complex variable theory is, um, is a very powerful mathematical theory. And it says that um, there are it, it, the connections between positive numbers and negative numbers are much deeper than you thought when you un only understood real numbers on a real number line. So, okay. In fact, if you only understood real numbers, you would think there are two different infinities. You would think there's a positive infinity and a negative infinity. That's what you would think, right? You can walk up the uh, you can walk <laughs> up the the real line in the positive direction. And you can walk down the real line in the negative direction. Okay. If you approach infinity this way, you get one infinity. And if you approach infinity this way, you get another infinity. So there must be two different infinities. But there's not two different infinities. Complex variable theory tells us there is only one infinity. And we are approaching this infinity one way and another way, but it's the same point at infinity. And to see that it's the same point, as you go to infinity in this direction, you are going up to the North Pole. And as you go to infinity in this direction, you are going to the North Pole. That's the same infinity, it's the same point. There's a one-to-one -one mapping from the points on this circle to the points on this line, okay? And it's complex variable theory that explains that a sum of positive numbers that is divergent can converge to a negative number. <laughs> and this is a very subtle result and it's very interesting and very powerful mathematics. Okay, this is a very deep and interesting concept and this is, I'm not, this is not a joke. This is real. I mean, to make a pun out of it, okay? The real numbers <laughs> can really converge to a negative number. Okay? Yes, sir. That, that's it. That's <laughs> thing. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Yep, sure. Hello, sir. Uh, am I audio? Uh, so it was yeah. pleasure listening to you. And uh, I have a question uh, that you, uh, like you showed us how to find the root of the fifth order polynomial in the beginning. And I, uh, I had a question regarding that, like how do we calculate the other roots of the polynomial? Ah, ah you can certainly do so. Um, so there are several ways to do so. So what you do, um, let me get a piece of paper. That is possible, but using the perturbation. Sure, sure. So there are several ways to do it. Um, so what, what the, the problem I gave you was to find the roots of x to the five plus x equals one. That, that was the equation we, we wanted to solve. Yes, sir. Okay, and one and and a a, pos, a simple way to do it. There are many ways to do it, but a simple way to do it approximately is to say what I will do is I will put an epsilon into the problem over here, and so yes. now I will consider the problem x to the five plus epsilon x equals one. Now, of course, the problem we are interested in is what happens when epsilon equals one. But yes. I'm putting in an epsilon. And now we, we have put epsilon in here because I know how to solve the, uh, 
the problem about uh, the problem with epsilon equals zero. That is, I put an epsilon into the problem in such a way that we can solve the unperturbed problem. That is the problem with epsilon equals zero. And that problem is x to the five equals one, okay? And I will call this x zero to the five equals one because x zero is the first term in the perturbation series. Now, I know how to solve this equation and we were looking for the real root. So we took the solution to this equation, which was x equals one. But there are five roots to this equation and they are uh, x zero equals one. But another solution to that equation is e to the two i pi over five. That's another solution. And then there's e to the four i pi over five, e to the six i pi over five and so on. So there are five different roots to this equation. If we take this root over here, this root, which is a complex number and take that as our first term in our perturbation series and then calculate the next term and the next term and the next term and so on and add up the terms in that series, it will converge to one of the complex roots. And for each different starting point, we will get a different complex root of that equation. And it will work perfectly well, and it will, be, it will converge to the exact answer. This is, this is a very easy perturbation theory because we don't, we're not required to use summation theory to interpret a divergent series. We don't have to, it will be a conversion series and it will be a conversion series of complex numbers. And mm. those complex numbers will indeed converge to each of the five complex roots of that well, one real root and four complex roots to that equation. Okay. Yes, and uh, that's, that's a, a very beautiful and powerful idea. Yes, sir. So when you use uh, the first, root of the x to the power five equal to one, that is x equal to one, you got some answer. Like I, I had a question that, is, how is it related, uh, the x equal to one root of x to the power five equal to one is related to the root you got of the original problem. Like, is there some geometrical relation between the x equal to one and the answer you got? To the, well, I'm not sure I really understood what you're, what you're saying. How is it related? I mean, we've, you found the um, solution, you found one root using the real root of the reduced problem that is epsilon equal to zero. So how are the two geometrically related? Like why did the X equal to one solution to the reduced polynomial gave us the, uh, that particular solution? Okay, well, yeah. So of course, I mean, if we look in the complex plane, what we see is that what I think what you're saying is if we take the epsilon equals zero case, yes, there are five roots, which are, you know, we could, they're here and here and here, you know, so, so there, 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 there's a pentagon of roots. Yes. Sir. And, and we we were only looking in in the talk that I gave. We were only looking at this root, but indeed there are altogether five complex roots in the complex plane. As we added up the perturbation series, we came closer and closer to the correct answer, and the correct answer is, in fact, over here. So as we were adding up more and more terms in the series, cool. the partial sums were approaching, I can, the partial sums were getting closer and closer and closer to the correct answer. And the same thing happens in the complex plane. So as we add up more terms in the series, we will get a sequence of, of dots in the complex plane and eventually this will, you know, this, this will converge 
to some limiting value, which is over here. And this is the correct answer. So in a sense, what we've done is we have deformed the original polynomial equation, which you, know, you can plot this polynomial equation and you can draw it in the complex plane and you can see those roots. If you made a two dimensional plot, you would see that this fifth degree polynomial equation crosses zero um, at five different points, okay? And what we see is that as we add up the partial sum, this will wiggle around in the complex plane and eventually converge to a point over here. And that is the exact answer. And it's one of the complex, one of the five complex roots to the answer. And, and this will happen not just on the real axis, but it will, it will, you know, on the real axis, it was sort of bouncing around, but getting closer and closer and closer to this, to this ex exact answer over here around 0.7 or something. Okay. Yes. And indeed, these will also bounce around in the complex plane, but eventually converge onto the exact answer over here. So, okay. will so, they, so there's a, to this the root that, that is nearest to them, like in some sense. It, it has to do with the fact that you have deformed the problem by putting an epsilon in it. Okay. Okay. And then you are you are finding the roots of, def of, of a deformed problem. And these roots, there's an infinite sequence. As you mm -hmm. add up more and more terms in the series, the partial sums form an infinite sequence. And so you can study this problem. You can think about this problem. I think what you're suggesting is that you could study this problem as, as a topological problem. And you could look at the, you could see the first point and then it, the partial sums are wandering around in the complex plane and then eventually settling down on the exact answer. Okay, and you could study the, the topologies um, because you are truncating, you are making a very complicated function by inserting this, this parameter epsilon, expanding in some polynomial structure so you have a very complicated topology, right? It's, it's not just a fifth degree polynomial, it's some high degree structure. And you're finding the roots of that. And then you're watching those roots converge onto the final exact answer to the problem. Okay, so <clears throat> you could study, you certainly can study the nature of perturbation theory as a topological problem and watch the roots, watch the, the topology getting closer and closer to the topology. I mean, you're, you're replacing this polynomial in effect by this polynomial, you're changing the topology. And then you're turning on this term here by letting epsilon get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually the topology smoothly approaches the topology of this equation. It is no longer this equation, it's this equation. That's sort of what is going on here, right? Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yeah, but this, but the, the topology that you need to study is um, the topology not on the real axis, but in the complex plane, because that is what is really going to reveal to you the structure of what is happening. If you only look on the real axis, you will not get a clear picture of what is going on. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, the only way we can really understand real variable theory is to study its generalization into the complex plane. And um, I mean, you know, why does a fifth degree have polynomial have five roots, mm -hmm. but only one of them is on the real axis? Real variable calculus cannot explain that. Certainly. It's too difficult. And you need to have complex calculus to understand really what is going on. And the topology is really a complex topology. Okay, so you need to take it, you need to you need to apply complex analysis to understand.
understand real analysis. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you very much. I yeah, can. sure, sure. So, hi, Professor. Hi. Before asking my question, I wanted to uh, ask a follow-up question on this last discussion. So if you uh, add an epsilon in front of the first term, the x to the power of fifth term, then you only have a single root for the equation. So right, right. And so where have the other four roots gone? Right. Yeah, and, and the approximation would not give you five different answers, right? Oh, but it does. <laughs> it does. So what you so to find to find the other four roots, you have to ask, where are they? Yeah. Okay. And the answer is so. I will show you. So, 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 I was in the last question. I was saying that there are five roots. If you put the epsilon in front of the x to the five term, yeah. Okay, and if you if you're talking about physics, this is called weak coupling perturbation theory. So when we put the epsilon in front of the x term, that corresponds to doing strong coupling perturbation theory, which typically gives you a convergent series. But if you put the epsilon in front of the x to the five term, you're doing weak coupling perturbation theory. And that is the kind of perturbation theory that you do when you're doing Feynman diagrams. Okay, which you may not know about, I don't, I don't know, but you, in, a, in more advanced courses, you will learn about them. Where did the other four roots go? And the other four roots go off to infinity. In fact, they form a square at infinity. <laughs> okay? So in order to do the perturbation theory, to find the other four roots, where are they? You first need to study where those roots are at infinity. Okay, now, of course, when epsilon is equal to zero, the roots are all infinite, and they're off at, in, the, in infinity in the complex plane. So in order to really understand the problem, you have to ask, where are those roots when epsilon is not exactly zero, but is still very, very small? Okay, so we have to ask, what happens... So what, what we are asking here is, <clears throat> what we are asking here is, <clears throat> suppose you have the problem x to the five plus x equals one. That's, that's what we're doing, okay? And you insist on putting an epsilon in front of the x to the five term because you like to do weak coupling perturbation theory, which is fine, okay. okay? Now, when epsilon equals zero, this term disappears and you can see the root x equals one, but there are four more roots. How are we ever gonna find those roots? Okay, so, <clears throat> so what I'm telling you is that those roots are very big when epsilon is very close to zero, okay? So therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna look for them for values of epsilon that are very close to zero. You follow me? Okay, so if epsilon is very close to zero, I'm telling you that the other four roots are very big. So this term, so, so, well, if we look at this term, this term is very big, but yeah. one is just one. One is not very big. <clears throat> so we have the approximate equation that we can throw away that one. That's not very important compared with X. And therefore this term, must balance this term, okay? When epsilon is very, very small. Yeah. 
So we need to, so this is called the method of dominant balance. This term is very big. It must balance this term that's very big because the one is clearly unimportant. How do we know one is unimportant? Because X is very big. Yeah. Therefore, we have the equation epsilon X to the five is approximately equal to minus X. Okay. Okay. In fact, that symbol is, is a very serious mathematical symbol. It is asymptotic to minus X in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So this is an asymptotic equation we have to solve. And the simple way to solve it is to divide both sides by X. So I will do that. And I get epsilon X to the four is asymptotic to minus one. Okay. Yep. And I'm solving for X. So I will divide by epsilon and I get X to the four is asymptotic to minus one over epsilon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and now I take the fourth root and I learned that X to the four is asymptotic to one over epsilon to the one fourth power, okay, times minus one to the one fourth. Okay, and now one over epsilon to the one fourth is becoming infinitely big when epsilon is zero. Yeah. And minus one to the one quarter, there are four solutions to that. What is minus one to the one quarter? Yeah. It is, there are four possibilities. It is X has to be um, E to the I pi over four. That's one possibility. And E yeah. to the um, three I pi over four and e to the five i pi over four and e to the seven i pi over four, okay? So there are four roots in the complex plane and the four roots lie in a square shape and they are over here, over here, over here, and over here. They look like this. Those are the four roots and they're very far away from the origin. How far? The distance is approximately, the distance is approximately um, one over epsilon to the one fourth power. Okay? Yep. And so if we do perturbation theory and begin with these, each of these four roots, and we do perturbation theory, it will, and we sum up the perturbation theory, it will converge at epsilon equals one to the each of the four complex roots that you were asking about. Okay. So we're we're pretty tough. We we can use complex variable theory to understand a real, a simple looking real polynomial equation. Okay. But you notice we had to understand complex variable theory in order to make progress. Okay. This is pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I agree. And uh, there's one more question. Could, in fact, we could spend all day talking just about this, this simple problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So for my next question, uh, I wanted to ask you about your statements like, uh, the first few terms of a divergent series contain, uh, I mean, enough information to give us a very good answer, very, uh, which is very close close to the actual answer. So, right. is there, like, of course, of course, the key question here, the key word that is very, very subtle and deep in what you just said was the word few. Yeah. <laughs> so you said you said the first few terms and yeah. we don't know 
until we begin analyzing the problem, what we mean by few. Few could be, if, if you like answers that are accurate to say, you're a physicist. So you would like answers, let's say, that are accurate to 1%. Mm -hmm. that, would, that might make an astronomer very happy. Okay, and you, so you want 1%. So how big is few? Are three terms enough? Does few mean three or maybe five or maybe 10? And this depends on the kind of problem you're solving. So this is, this is why physics is interesting. There isn't a simple answer. I can't, it's not always true that the first five terms are what's needed. So each different problem has a different meaning of the word few. But what I'm telling you is typically for hard problems, the first few terms in the series, whatever that is, will tell you a lot about the final answer to the problem. It doesn't give you the exact answer, but it gives you a very good answer, very accurate answer. But um, okay. so let's assume you take first three terms of the series. Now, there's one way uh, of finding the answer. You can mm -hmm. add them all up or you can use other methods like the methods you describe in the presentation. And right. is there any limit to how close you can get to an answer by developing an algorithm of sorts? Uh -huh. So you're asking a very good question and the answer is not known. You're asking which summation technique should I use to get yeah the most information out of the first few terms. Yeah. Okay. And this is a problem. This is a deep problem in a field of mathematics called information theory. Mm -hmm. So the information is there, but you're asking me what is the most efficient way to extract the most accurate possible answer from the first few terms. If I have calculated five terms, what is the best technique to use to get the best information? Yes. Okay. And there, th there is a whole field of um, mathematical analysis um, called, um, uh, one name for it is the uh, maximum entropy, okay? And there, and this, the, the question you're asking is, what is the optimal technique for extracting that information? And the answer is, I don't know. And it is not known. And this is the kind of problem that, it, this is a difficult problem. So we have a bunch of techniques that we can use but we don't know which is the best technique, not now. And the best technique, of course, depends on the particular problem you're trying to solve. There isn't one technique that always works for all problems, but rather given a problem, you have to then think about which is the best way to get the information I'm looking for out of the problem. Should I do this or should I do that? In the case, of um, in the case of this um, polynomial problem, where should I put my epsilon? Where's the best place? I don't know. Okay, so I do know that if I put the epsilon in front of this X, I will get a perturbation series that is convergent. And if I put the epsilon in front of here, I will get a perturbation series that is divergent. But I know how to sum a divergent series, and I also know how to sum a convergent series, which will give me the best answer for the least number of pen strokes. In other words, if I have only one hour to calculate mathematically, how in that one hour can I get the best, most accurate answer? And I don't know, because there are probably an infinite or 
a huge, I don't know if it's infinite, but a huge number of ways of putting an epsilon into that problem. And I don't know what the best way is. I mean, for example, I could replace the x to the five by x to the two plus epsilon. Mm -hmm. Or maybe x to the three plus epsilon. Or maybe x to the four plus epsilon. Or maybe x to the one half plus epsilon. And there are an infinite number of possibilities there. What's the best one? I don't know. I mean, this is, and in fact, if for this particular problem, if you were to analyze the best possible way just for this problem, that is probably worth a nice publication. You can experiment and try which is the best way to get the best, most accurate information about the answer to the problem with the smallest amount of work. Yeah. I don't know what the best way is. I, I can just try some simple things, but I don't know what the best way is. The best way is probably not the most simple way, but I don't know. I really don't know. So, so, you, so information theory tries to optimize the amount of information in the data that you have. Okay, so for example, just as a good example for you, imagine that you're standing on a street next to a bank. Okay, you're just standing there, okay? And a guy walks into the bank and he suddenly <laughs> runs out of the bank with a bag full of money and jumps into his car and starts to drive away. Okay? He's driving away very quickly. And you suddenly realize this guy has just robbed the bank. What will I do? So you pull out your cell phone and you quickly take a picture of his car. Okay, now because he's going away very quickly and he's also pretty far away, your picture is very blurry. And you only have a finite of amount of information about that car because the information, because your uh, cell phone reduces that information to a finite number of pixels. How do you extract the information <clears throat> from those pixels and read the license plate? So if you look at the picture, you cannot read the license plate. But if you use information theory, you can unblur that photograph and you can actually read the numbers on the license plate of the car. Okay, but what we're doing is in some sense the same thing. Yep. By taking an exact problem, namely this problem, and putting an epsilon into it, we are blurring the problem. And we are then reducing the problem to a bunch of pixels, which are a finite number of terms in that perturbation series I say it's a finite number because we can only calculate a finite number. We can't do an infinite amount of work. How do we optimize the information contained in those 10 terms in your perturbation series? Yeah. And I don't know, but this is an interesting problem in information theory and it's a deep problem. If you make progress on it, you should publish it because it's good stuff. This is really good mathematics. Okay, yes. This is a field, this is an area of mathematics in progress. You know, freshman calculus is understood. Calculus, one real variable, we understand that. This is not understood. And this is, this is ongoing, uh, interesting mathematics. Yeah. So, so this is a research area. How do you get information? out of a hard problem that you have blurred 
into an easy problem. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I'm not even sure if there's a limit to the information, the amount of information that we can extract from the terms. Like yeah, we don't we don't know. This is this is an open problem, and um, and it's 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 very important and very interesting modern mathematics, and we should think about this because we know that when we blur a problem, we don't lose all of the information. Even if when we blur the problem, the perturbation series is divergent. The information is not lost, it's there. And we can pull that information out of the problem, but what is the best way to pull the information? We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I hope this was interesting. <laughs> These are very interesting questions. So I have a feeling that I've been talking for a long time and you guys, must be rather tired. Not um, <laughs> Thanks for the discussion. Uh, so sure. I will keep sure. Uh, Aisha, thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful discussion we have had here. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, taking upon that, uh, how much of that few is enough part, I'm pretty much convinced that few hours of this lecture, surely not enough for all of us. And if there were a way, if we could possibly keep on having this conversation, but uh, if only if that were possible. So, sir, uh, uh, thank you so much for having answering all these questions so passionately and with all the patience that you showed. And uh, mm -hmm. we are surely not tired. And I hope that you are not much tired too. And I'm just fine. <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Ah, so, so we would uh, like to conclude this talk now. Uh, mm -hmm. Just one thing that. Uh, if you remember the last time we had some uh, like technical checks on Pi Day, you mentioned that your granddaughter is partly Indian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, sir. So if ever it happens that you visit India, and we hope you surely do, we would love to have you here at our institute IIT Rudy. It will we will be really fortunate, and it will be a pleasure having you here, sir. Well, thank you. It would be my pleasure. Um, I have been to. Um, India once uh, because uh, there was a conference in uh, Mumbai and mm -hmm. uh, and had a wonderful time uh, and of course as you can imagine I love Indian cooking and uh, and and we had a we had a, a wonderful time um, and we I visited the institute in Mumbai and it was it was a wonderful trip sometime I hope to come back my granddaughter um, has flown with her mother who's Indian her mother is a historian and okay. she she does uh, research on the history of India and she often comes to India and my granddaughter has come to India and she has even flown over uh, Mount Everest <laughs> yeah, that's, that is and she's flown over Mount Everest several times. So she has been able to see the top of Mount Everest, which I have never done. Uh, but yes, I, yep. I hope sometime it would be lovely to come back to India. Uh, it's a remarkable, gigantic country. Um, and yes, indeed, it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I will keep that in mind. If I'm ever back in India, maybe I can visit um, uh, and, you know, see Rookie. Uh, that, that certainly is a possibility. We don't know. Hopefully the COVID problem will uh, be solved. We, I hope they come up with a really good antiviral medicine that just eliminates the problem. Bang. Just like that, it would be wonderful. It will um, surely be so. Uh, I I certainly hope that it will be found. They're working on it very hard. I mean, it's it's a possibility that that um, they will find it uh, very soon. I think that I'm being optimistic, but I hope it's found. So, but yes, indeed. Um, so my beautiful granddaughter is. Um, 
uh, just had her birthday. Yes, uh, your daughter is on Pi Day. Yes. <laughs> and her name is Pia. That is so, quite a nice, quite a beautiful name, sir. Yeah, it is a beautiful name. And she is a very, very um, smart and sensitive young girl. And she's 14. So, so she's really terrific. But yes, indeed, it would be very nice to, to visit Rorke. Yes, sir. So you'll, you'll really love the place. It is on the foothills of the Himalayas. Rorke is a beautiful place in Uttarakhand. And mm. we, we really wish that uh, you do come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's in northern India. It would be lovely to visit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much, sir. We had a wonderful lecture up here. And well, I, I thank you all for the invitation. And it was very, it was a lot of fun for me to, to meet you thank guys. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.